Hey guys, so today I'm gonna to be walking you through the pantry items that you should have on hand at all times because if you stock these basic items in your pantry, you are going to be able to cook almost everything that you need for your family. I'm also gonna be showing how much I keep on hand, both in my kitchen, so right here where, I, where I'm cooking, along in my back pantry, my sources, and where I store everything. We live in a manufactured home, so there's not a ton of extra storage. I don't have a basement. We don't have a garage. I don't have an official root cellar. So all of my food has to be packed into our house, and we just have a little over 1,200 square feet. So not as tiny as it could be, but it's definitely not huge. So I'm gonna show you all of the places and the minimum amounts that we keep on hand. So up first, number one thing to have on hand is flour. Now, it could be any type of flour that you want. I know some of you are gonna be having gluten-free flour. This is an all-purpose organic, organic on bleached flour, and I also keep bread flour on hand. Now, we're gonna talk about wheat berries in just a minute, but I start with flour because if you've got flour on hand, you are gonna be able to use all the other ingredients that I'm gonna list out in these pantry must-have items to create a plethora of homemade food for your family. Now, I keep right here, these are uh, the ball canisters, and so when you pop the lid off, they do have inside there a rubber gasket. I can't say that they're 100% airtight, but they're pretty close. So this is right in my kitchen, right next to my stove. So you can see right here next to the stove. So this is where I keep the items that I'm gonna be using when I'm baking, right next to the oven. Now, also is sugar, which this canister is getting low. I don't need to refill it quite yet, but gonna be up there pretty soon. And some type of sweetener is on my list as well. Now, this is actually organic sugar, so kind of like sugar in the raw, but organic. I get it from Costco. You might be using, I do also have when I'm doing keto, I don't do keto all the time. I get questions about that a lot. I've talked about it in different podcast episodes and blog posts. I cycle through with keto. I have low thyroid and I find if I do keto too long, usually if I try to do keto where I'm in actual nutritional ketosis for longer than six to eight weeks, I really start to notice it and my thyroid takes a hit and so I have to cycle off of it. But I do keep some additional sweeteners on hand. So depending on whatever it is you need, I've got monk fruit sweetener that I keep. This is low glycemic index, keto approved. I get this from Costco. So I just get a bag of that from Costco. And I also keep a little bit of powdered erythritol on hand. So this is kind of like my whole baking cupboard. Honey is also an excellent sweetener to have on hand. I keep both honey and regular sugar because I can, y'all have seen, and we're gonna take a trip to the canning area here in just a minute. I keep sugar on hand for my canning. I do not use honey in canning. Most of my canning is low sugar anyways. The reason I don't use honey in my canning is because you're heating it and I buy raw honey, and when you heat it and when you're canning it, you're destroying all of the great and wonderful benefits that are found within that raw honey, and it's a lot more expensive, and you're waste, I shouldn't say you're wasting it, but in a way, you really are because you're destroying those benefits of the raw honey. So I don't use honey in my canning. I use a small amount of organic raw sugar instead. Now, some of the other items that you're gonna have in your pantry, and so I'm gonna walk you through them just because we all have them, I have them in this spot, is some type of leavening agent. So here is baking soda. Here is baking powder. And I keep them, this one's totally full, it's pint, so it's two cups worth of aluminum-free baking soda and powder is what I always go for. And then this one I'm gonna need to fill up. This is a quart size, so this is actually the same amount as this almost, because this is about two cups worth. But you're gonna wanna have some type of leavening agent. So this is gonna be great for doing some of your things like quick breads and cakes and cookies and biscuits and those types of things. Now, we need to talk about one of the next items that can fall under the leavening, and especially when we're talking about flour, and that is yeast. So I do have some dry active yeast. I buy it in the big old bag from Costco, and I've had that dry active yeast for well over a year, and I keep it in my fridge. It stores and it stays um, active longer that way. But store-bought yeast, a little bit hard to find right now. So take a walk with me. Okay, you ready? We're gonna dive into the fridge. 
So here's the large bag of active dry yeast that I keep. Like I shared, I get this from Costco. But if you're unable to find yeast in the store, which a lot of people aren't able to, is sourdough starter. So this is homemade yeast, essentially. You're capturing the wild yeast that lives on the grains and you're creating an environment that it can grow and proliferate along with some good bacteria to create a live culture of yeast and good bacteria, lactobacilli, in a sourdough culture. So I just baked a whole bunch of sourdough bread yesterday. So I am putting my starter to rest because I usually do the majority of my baking once a week for one hour. Those of you who went through that live web class with me know my whole secrets there. So this is going back into the fridge to take a little bit of a rest until later in the week. So if you do not have a sourdough starter or you haven't had such great success with one in the past, the only two things that you need to create a sourdough starter is water, and flour. You can do gluten-free sourdough starters, you can do ancient grain, you can do regular store-bought flour. You do not need potatoes and you do not need sugar and you do not need honey and you don't need any store-bought yeast. In fact, if you use those items, it can actually throw off the balance and create an unhealthy starter or one that doesn't thrive. So beneath this video, I have got a link, one to all of the different stuff that I'm talking about. I've got links and resources, but my free sourdough video series is melissaknorris.com forward slash learn sourdough. So you can go there and learn how to make all kinds of sourdough starters with the different flours you may have on hand with just water. Okay, so that brings me to our next few items on the list. In relation to flour, I also keep wheat berries on hand. So here is the corner of my kitchen where I've got my grain mill and I have the video on how to make your own wheat flour at home with grinding and showing you my mills. So you can check that out. I'll pop that in below. But this is where I keep my hands-on amount. So I know this looks like a fairly small amount of wheat berries, but I keep hard white wheat on hand. This is what I use for my bread flour. So anything, uh, the majority of my sourdough, sandwich breads, artisan loaves, biscuits, anything like that, I use my hard white wheat for it. And this one's organic. Then the other type of wheat berry that I keep on hand and use a lot is spelt. Spelt is an ancient grain, but it's what I use for my pastry items. So sweet breads, like sitting right here. I told you I did my baking yesterday for the week. So this is a chocolate sourdough loaf, along with some homemade mini hand pies or AKA homemade pop tarts. So for things like sweet bread, like banana bread, or this chocolate sourdough discard bread, which I have a video in the recipes on my blog, I'll link to that too. Um, that is what I like to use spelt for. It's an excellent pastry type flour. I do, so I keep these right above my mill because those are the two that I use the most when I'm grinding my own flour and, and those types of fresh ground flour types, so I keep them right here. I do have right up above me there because I don't use it as often is my einkorn. So this is ancient grain einkorn. It's an excellent, excellent grain. It is more expensive than either the spelt or the hard white wheat. And you have to adapt the recipes more if the recipe hasn't been formulated for einkorn already. So I don't use it as much, but I do use it some. So that's why it's up a little bit higher. So you'll notice that I keep small amounts in the kitchen that I'm like using from all the time. But then I've got my storage amount, so I go shopping from my own pantry in the back. So I'm gonna show you that, and then I'll also give you the amounts that I keep on hand, or my goal of what I keep on hand for everything. Okay guys, so this is my back pantry storage area, and I brought you back here because the next step item on my list, well, we've got a couple of them, but the first is fat sources. So fat source, we butcher our own pig. So I have my own lard source and I have my own tallow source from our beef. However, I'm only butchering once a year and that is not enough fat to take us through the entire year. So I purchase quite a bit of our fat sources from the store. First up, butter. Real grass-fed butter. I get mine from Costco and it stores awesome in the fridge. Well, it does store awesome in the fridge, but this is te technically my freezer. Sorry. So I've got this. So whenever I go to Costco, right now they're putting a limit on things because of the, you know, the whole pandemic thing. And I haven't been to Costco in over a month, but 
whenever I go, I always stock up and butter handles beautifully in the freezer. So it will last for months in the freezer. When it thaws out, you won't notice any difference whatsoever. So I always keep this on hand in the freezer. I think I have a minimum, I'll have to count. I think I have a minimum of like 25 pounds of butter. Now up next, because you might be dairy free and I like to have lots of different fats on hand for different things with cooking. So one of the other items that I keep on hand for fat, and again, I do get this from Costco, is the organic virgin coconut oil. This is the cold press unrefined. So coconut oil is a great, I like to use coconut oil for baking. It lends itself really well when I'm doing things like cakes or muffins or cupcakes that cook in a pan. Coconut oil tends to spread though, so I don't use it as much for when I'm baking cookies. I use coconut oil basically in place of a lot of recipes in place of shortening, either coconut oil or butter, because we don't use shortening at all here in our house. The other fat sources I keep on hand besides coconut oil and butter is olive oil and avocado oil. So I don't use canola oil or vegetable oil. You're noticing a trend here. I don't use um, shortening either because I try to stay away from hydrogenated and GMO crops. So avocado oil, I use in place of vegetable oil in baking recipes that require um, an oil like this where I don't wanna use melted coconut oil or melted butter. I love this. It's very flavor flavorless for the most part, which is actually really good because if you've ever tried to bake a cake, with organic extra virgin olive oil, it doesn't taste so hot. So I like to use the avocado oil and I love to make homemade mayonnaise with the avocado oil as well because it doesn't impart um, a huge amount of a, of a different flavor. So it really lets the vinegar and the salt and the egg and the other things in your homemade mayonnaise shine through. So these are, um, I've got one size of all of this in my main kitchen in the cupboards, but I keep a backup of at least one backup. So when I get out, run out of in the kitchen with what I'm cooking with. I know I have a full one in back. Ideally, I have two. So that's my goal is to have two of every fat source, at least in the back. I have more of butter, um, especially in times where it may be hard to get to the store and stock is limited. But I've always tried to run my pantry and my kitchen that way, living so far out as we do when we've had different road closures and things in the past. It's kind of how I've always tried to stock it. Now the next item, because most of us don't have a way of making or this at home at all, is salt. So I use Redmond's Real Salt. Um, I get it in this 10 pound bucket because it's much, much cheaper to buy it this way and then I've got a lot on hand for when I'm doing my different herb salts and obviously baking and cooking and my preserving. I use this for all of my ferments as well. So I buy this in the 10 pound bucket and then I just keep the salt shaker that I use in the kitchen um, that I just keep refilling from this one back here. So this I actually get off of Amazon. I'll have the link, as, I'll have the links for everything beneath the post. So you can just go through there and grab everything that you need uh, beneath the video. Uh, but 10 pounds of salt, I try to keep that on hand as a minimum at all times. Now this is an area that you guys know. So here is where I keep, I try to keep on hand 20 to 30 pounds of the organic unbleached flour. This is where I've got my einkorn wheat berries. So I've got a couple of bags here, which is usually about 10 pounds. I know this is a little bit hard to see. There's not a lot of light in here. And then this is where I keep my sugar. And I try to keep between um, 20 and 30 pounds of sugar. I don't use a ton of sugar. A lot of the stuff that I cook is and bake is low sugar and with my canning, but I do use some. So that's where I keep uh, these and I just keep them in the bags that they come in from the store. Now my wheat berries. So here is a five gallon food safe bucket. I actually have my canning rings here. So this is a food safe bucket and inside is some of my organic, you can see there is a moisture in there, little doohickey, I forget the name of those things, but you know what they do, they absorb the moisture for you. So this, 
actually, when I ordered it, came in the bucket just like this. So I have just left it in here like this. I've had this one um, going on close to a year. I've almost used all of it up. And you just put the lid right down on there. So you can use any five gallon bucket. But a lot of times what I'll do, and I'll show you that in a second, but we got to take a little trip because this is, um, I can't fit in here any more of my wheat berries. So, well, I could fit more in the bucket, but I should say here inside this pantry. So I'll show you what I do with the rest of the stuff. But the other item that is on my list that I wanted to draw your attention to is vinegar. So this is my homemade apple cider vinegar. And of course I always have that on hand and I've got a link on how I make that as well. So you can check that out. But I also buy organic apple cider vinegar from the store. And the reason I say to have both is because for canning, you cannot use homemade vinegar. For canning, it has to be 5% acidity. So I always buy some vinegar and make sure I have it on hand for my pickles that I make with canning and anything else I need to add acid to and using the vinegar when I'm canning for safety. And so see right here, 5%. Now this is an area that you guys know pretty well. So this is my, in the side of my kitchen where I keep a lot of my home preserved goods and a lot of my overflow that I'm cooking from. But one of the other items that are on the list is dried beans. Now these are my homegrown dried seed saved, also used as a dry bean, October bean. But this is all I have left from last year's harvest aside from my seed bean. So I keep my seed stock separate than my dried beans, even though I could use these to plant with, uh, just so that I never accidentally use all of my beans. I've always got my seed beans separate. Those are set aside. I know how many we need to plant to take us through, but I used more dried beans than I thought I had in years past. And especially in this time when we're doing even more, even for us, more cooking at home and trying to make less trips to the store. So I know that I need to plant more beans. October beans this year. So I have more dried beans. So I also have some dried pinto beans and these are from the store. I've got a, a few black beans and a couple of varieties of dried beans that we don't grow here ourselves. At lentils is another one. Um, but some type of dried bean. If you've got this on hand, then I can quickly turn this into homemade refried beans. I can do rice and beans. I can do bean and ham soup, which is one of my favorites with cornbread. Oh, there's nothing better. Um, you can make, uh, obviously, your chilies, your soups. Like, there's just so many things that you can do with dried beans to really stretch a lot of other ingredients. They're also a great source of protein and calorie-wise for vegetables. These are on the higher end um, in comparison to a lot of our other vegetables. So, ideally, I keep... a about, right now I'm trying to keep about 20 pounds of dried beans on hand, knowing that we're going to be planted, but I won't have mine planted full to harvest and then ready to be shelled and dried till October. That's what we call them October beans. They're not ready to go until October here. So that's how much I'm keeping on hand of that. Then the other item that I don't grow here on the homestead I like to keep on hand is rice. For one of the same reasons, you can stretch rice. It stores fairly well, and I can stretch it into so many different dishes. I can use it, I use it in my cabbage rolls as part of the stuffing. Of course, just rice um, itself. I like to cook it with broth and add in some odd and in vegetables and meat if I don't have enough for an entire meal. Um, chicken and rice casserole, chicken and white rice soup. I mean, just so many different things that you can do with rice. We love to do stir fries, add it to stir fries. Uh, now, I have white rice. White rice doesn't go rancid as fast as brown rice. I also have some brown rice on hand because I grind that up and use it for some of my gluten-free sourdough starters. So whatever rice you want to have on hand is fine. I find for us, a 25-pound bag of rice lasts us, our family of four, for well over a year. It lasts for a really long time. So I keep that here. Now, one of the other items that I keep on hand, we're going to take a walk back to the flower cupboard, and that's popcorn. So here is my big jar of popcorn, which I'm about halfway through now. Don't worry, I've got more in the back. But I love popcorn. It's kind of a comfort food, but it stores really well. You only need like a cup and it makes enough unpopped. Um, I don't even actually usually do a full, yeah, about a cup of unpopped. Makes a huge pot of popcorn. I always pop mine on the stove. I don't use the microwave or use popcorn maker. 
Um, and it's just delicious. We always have popcorn on movie night at least once a week, sometimes twice a week. And I just would not, I know it doesn't really turn into a lot of meals. I mean, you can make popcorn balls and fun things like that, but it is one of our favorite snack foods and we'll even have it in place of dessert on some nights. So I try to make sure I have around 20 pounds of popcorn on hand. Now, one of the other items is chocolate. Chocolate's not a necessity. Well, I don't know. I kind of think it may be. <laughs> so I like to keep chocolate on hand. Now I've got, this is the um, darker chocolate. It's 72%. Uh, um, all my chocolate chips are organic that I buy because of the soy lecithin. I try to avoid soy unless it's organic because that means it's non-GMO at the least. Um, and then this is just regular semi-dark. I rarely ever buy milk. It's usually always dark or semi-dark. And I will tell you the best price that I have found for organic chocolate chips, believe it or not, is Fred Meyers. They have a simple, I don't know if I have any unopened bags. Oh, I do actually, back in the other pantry. I'll show you my overflow area for restocking these types of things. Um, I think it's simple truth. It's a Fred Meyer brand, but they will get coupons and they'll go on sale usually once about every three months. And so I will buy like seven to 10 bags whenever they go on sale, usually once a quarter, um, so that I always have a ton of chocolate chips on hand because chocolate chip cookies, you can melt them down with some cream and make ganache. Like so many things are just better, better with chocolate, right? And if we're talking baking, you gotta have chocolate. Now my other thing of chocolate that I keep on hand, besides the chocolate chips, and that, we'll take another walk. That you saw in my organizing this cupboard with all of my mason jars. So this is my herbs and um, up here, my teas and medicinal herbs, and then my coffee because this lovely espresso machine right here. But this is where I keep my cocoa powder. Now in the back, I buy usually, um, I will buy 10 pounds is what I try to keep on hand of cocoa powder because if you have a fat source and sugar, and cocoa powder, I could technically make any of my chocolate that I needed to. And I use cocoa powder every day when I make my homemade mochas. So cocoa powder is like another necessity. You know what? And I didn't list coffee originally when I did a podcast episode on this, but coffee is, if you drink coffee, it is a, it is a necessity. So I have got my coffee beans right here. My coffee, I get from Camino Island Coffee. Um, and I've got a link which will give you 50% off if you wanna test them out. Now the reason that I use them, and that's a referral link, so I do get a commission, so thank you so much if you decide to use it, I appreciate it. But here's the reason that I love them. Many of you guys know, if you've been with me for any amount of time, is I had my upper stomach and esophagus biopsy for cancer almost 10 years ago now. And I've been able to get off prescription medications that I was taking for GERD and stomach ulcers up to actually at six times a day when it was at its worst. And I've been completely healed from that. But I can't drink regular coffee. If I try to drink regular coffee every day, then it will kick up um, and really start that acid production again. The only coffee I've been able to drink every day without issue is this and the reason for that is one it's organic but two it's shade grown so shade grown coffee has quite a bit less acid i want to say like over 60 percent less acid than non-shade grown coffee and coffee is a heavily pesticided crop so organic is a must the great thing is is they roast it and they ship all over the united states they roast it and then they ship it to me the very next day so i'm already on a mail order program i don't have to go anywhere to get it um they I keep track of how many pounds I use in a month. So this is one I keep fresh. I do keep a backup couple of pounds just in case something happens with the mail that I don't run out of coffee. Um, but this is one I have set on like automatic subscription. And like I said, you can check that out below, grab that link um, and get 50% off if you want to try it out too. And you can, you can, anyways, it's really fun, but enough about that. Let's move on to our next items. Okay. So up next, I was talking about my medicinal herbs there but we have to talk about spice stuff. Because if you have got some spices and herbs, then you're gonna be able to cook almost everything and add so much flavor. And I don't buy, um, now my husband, let me clarify. I don't buy things like taco mix or 
um, taco packets or dressing, salad dressing packets or what are all the things that you can buy in packets? Taco seasoning, chili, salad dressing, gravy mixes. I don't know. There's a lot of things you can buy in packets. I don't buy any of that stuff. But my husband loves some of these and he buys them. So you see them in my cupboard. It's totally fine. However, because I felt the need to preface that with you. So here's the container of the Redmond's Real Salt that I just continually refill. I've had this container for years now that I've stocked it in the 10 pound. So for a lot of my things, I just use my mason jars. So this is onion powder. This is garlic powder. This is cumin. The label gave it away, I know. <laughs> Chili powder. I've got turmeric. What else do I have? Oh, I've got my dill seed back there. So this, of course, came from our own garden, and I'm almost almost gone because it's time to start growing dill again. Like two or three weeks, mine should be popping up. So as you can see, I keep a large amount of this because I'm using these to season and make up all kinds of different things. My cinnamon and um, my baking ones, like, well, cinnamon I kind of use versatile-wise. Sometimes I use that on spicy things like chili, and but a lot more for baking. So nutmeg, ginger, and cinnamon I keep in the other cupboard. But here I keep these and I keep them in here. Now I wait until I've used this all down before I refill it, but I always make sure that I have behind it, so here, I've got my organic garlic powder. Here I've got my chili powder blend. So I keep these bags behind here because I will refill them up, but I wanna make sure I use everything that's in the jar first because this is the, the oldest before I top it off. But I don't have room, definitely don't have room, to store all of my back stock here. Now, I know some of you are gonna say, well, where, where do you get them from? It depends. Some of them I'll get in bulk if they have it, like at our local co-op. They have a big bulk food bin and I go and get baking powder. Um, Fred Meyers in their whole food section, they have the same thing. But for online, um, I really, the Frontier brand is a brand that I trust. That one's sold on Amazon. Um, and I've been doing a lot with Azure Standard, which you're gonna see in just a minute lately. And so that's, that's another source, but I'll show you because I don't have room to keep it all here. My other backup. Okay, so we're back. We're back at this spot. But what I was going to show you is this is my other overflow. So this is where I keep like my backup cumin seed. Uh, this is from Mountain Rose Herbs. That's another online um, source that you can order from. So I have different sources that I order from because sometimes they're out of stock. And especially right now, you're gonna find things are out of stock. And so I have to have multiple places that I can get things from and that I trust. This is that, the Simple Truth Organic from Fred Meyer. I was telling you about the chocolate chips. So this is the back, this is my back stock. So when my canisters get empty, I can come from my back stock here. So when those canisters get empty and I start to go from my back stock back here to fill them up, that's when I know I need to purchase more. I don't ever let my stock run completely out. Okay guys, so you're in my bedroom. And this is where I am keeping my extra back stock of all of my different wheat berries other than the einkorn and some of the hard white wheat that you actually saw in my back pantry. This is the stuff that I just got from Azure Standard and I'm super excited about it. I'm gonna show you my items on hand, but brace yourself because we're about to go underneath the bed. So this is where I'm keeping my back stock for right now because I don't have any other spot to put it. So I have left it sealed in these bags. Now here where we live, where it's cooler, I have never had an issue of bugs in my grains or in my flour. Some people like to put them in the freezer for a couple of weeks and then store them. I've never had any experience with that because I've never had in, any need to do it. I've never had bugs in my grains and flour. I don't know if I'm just lucky or what. So normally what I would do is if I had the other space in those five gallon buckets, or a bigger container, I would leave the grains in the bag and then put that bag inside the sealed five gallon bucket and seal that up. I know how fast I relatively quickly I go through different grains. So for right now, I am fine with this grain being like this in the bag. But this is the Spelt Grain Organic and it's a 25 pound bag. I had to look for a minute. I'm like, how big was this? Um, so I'm trying to keep a 25 pound bag 
uh, on hand of the spelt grains and then 50 pounds which I don't want to drag it out, but there it is underneath my bed. <laughs> I've got the spelt grains as long as some of my extra bulk sleeves of canning lids for this summer. I ran out of space, so those are under here. And then I've also got some of the pinto beans and my organic popcorn. Yeah, you, you're, you are truly looking underneath my bed right now. Some of the things I never ever thought I would be putting on YouTube, but here we go. I also have under there, which I didn't pull out and show you, is a 25 pound bag of bread flour, organic unbleached bread flour as well. And that I got from Azure Standard I like really well. Now, why do I have some store-bought ground flour when I also have a grain mill? The reason for that is I have discovered that when my husband and the kids are cooking, they don't want to use the mill and they don't want to convert a lot of their favorite recipes that they're used to doing to fresh ground flour because you have to convert it. Using fresh ground flour in a recipe that has not already been calculated for fresh ground flour or formulated for fresh ground flour, if you just tried to sub in fresh ground flour in place of regular store-bought all-purpose or bread flour, you're not going to be very happy with the results. <laughs> I've got a podcast and blog post episode on my tips for cooking with fresh ground flour, so you can check that out below as well. But I found for doing things like pie crust, which is what this is right here, and biscuits, that they don't get as flaky if I'm using all fresh ground flour. I've tried lots of different formulations and lots of different things, but I have found to get the texture that I want, I use some of my store-bought flour. So that's kind of the reason. And there's some recipes that I will do a hybrid. So I'm using half fresh ground flour and half store-bought. And I feel like that just gives the texture that especially my picky eaters in my family who really don't care if it's healthy or not, <laughs> that they like and that they prefer. And to me, that's the ultimate goal. So that's why I keep a mixture of both. Um, wheat berries to grind into my own flour on hand, as well as store-bought flour. Now, one of the last items that I keep on hand, and storage-wise, because I have nearly the shelf life that most of the other items I've shared with you, but that's dairy. We don't have a dairy animal yet here on the homestead, so I still buy my milk and my cream, my butter, as you know, and my cheese. Now, powdered milk is fine. You can use powdered milk if you want to have a backup. Some of the non-dairy milks will store just fine on the shelf. And here's what I've discovered. Cheese, if it's grated, freezes great. If you freeze it in block form and then try to slice it later, I find it's really crumbly. So I will freeze shredded cheese, but I don't like to freeze up the blocks. I find it just doesn't thaw very well. But softer cheeses like mozzarella, they freeze really well. So I will freeze logs of mozzarella and then let those thaw and use those later on. So if you've got all of these pantry staples, then you don't need to buy bread from the store. Uh, you don't need to buy tortillas. Like there's so many things, crackers. You don't need to buy any of that from the store because you've already got all the ingredients you need to make everything like croissants and oh my goodness, just all the things. The sourdough sandwich bread that doesn't use any store-bought yeast that was one of my recent videos. You can check that one out as well. Um, all of those things, if you just keep these on hand in your pantry, you can eliminate, and you'll notice there was no box mixes of cake mixes or muffin mixes or any of those types of things because you can make it, if you've got these items on hand, you can make all of those things, pretty much almost all of your meals. Obviously, we're going to be adding in some meat and some vegetables, but so many of your meals and your dishes you can make if you've got these basic items on hand. Okay, thanks so much guys. I look forward to reading your comments below.